All right, so chapter 45 is all about the endocrine system and hormones. Hormones, we've talked about previously, they act as your long distance regulators, the chemical signals, chemical signals that are secreted into your circulatory system and are able to send out messages throughout the body. Um, they are able to reach all parts of the body through your body fluids, but they can only actually interact with cells, the target cells that have receptors for them. Um, there are two systems that are able to coordinate communication throughout your body, your endocrine system and your nervous system. The endocrine system, um, the hormones are able to go out throughout the whole body. They're more longer acting responses. They take a little longer to get going. Um, they impact such processes as reproduction, development, metabolism, growth, behavior. While the nervous system uses high-speed electrical signals along neurons, which are able to regulate specific cells. So endocrine signaling is one way information is transmitted between cells. They, uh, it's called intercellular signaling, and it depends on the type of secreting cell that is doing the signaling and the route the signal is taking to reach its target. With endocrine signaling, the hormones are secreted into your extracellular fluids. Um, they are able to move via the bloodstream. And we talked about different things that they're able to maintain, but they also, the, the goal behind them is to maintain homeostasis and to deal with responses to stimuli and regulate your growth and development. There are signaling types known as paracrine and autocrine signaling. Um, local regulators are molecules that aren't necessarily hormones, gases, growth factors, prostaglandins that only act over short distances, so they have to reach their targets via diffusion. Paracrine signal signaling is when they are near the secreting cells. Autocrine signaling is when the targeting cell is also the secreting cell. Synaptic signaling is involving the nervous system. The neurons form specialized junctions with the target cells. Those are called synapses. And then at these synapses, the neurons secrete what are called neurotransmitters that are able to use, diffuse short distances and bind to target cell receptors. When we have neuroendocrine signaling, a specialized neurosecretory cells will secrete neurohormones that then can travel to target cells via the bloodstream. So there's your synaptic. The neuron is signaling at the synapse, is signaling the um, molecule to be released and then allowing that target cell to respond with the neurosecretory cell. It's able to send the neurohormone from throughout the blood to reach its target cell. Um, animal species often can communicate with pheromones, chemicals that are re released throughout the environment. These are able to mark trails, aka how ants keep coming back. Um, for food, identify territories, serve as warnings, and attract mates. There are tissues in which endocrine cells are grouped together that do not have, um, that form organs that are ductless. They're called endocrine glands. Um, since they have no ducts, they secrete the hormones directly into their surrounding fluid. While exocrine glands have ducts and are able to secrete substances like sweat and mucus and digestive enzymes, into cavities or body surfaces. And then there are organs that can have both endocrine and exocrine glands, your liver, since it also makes um, enzymes as well as pancreas, and then your gonads. Um, exocrine glands alone are not a part of the endocrine system, but you can have organs that have both endocrine and exocrine glands. So the major endocrine glands are shown here. You've got your gonads, your pancreas, your adrenal glands, which are found on top of your kidneys, your parathyroid and your thyroid gland, your pituitary gland, your pineal gland, and your hypothalamus. And then there are organs that actually contain endocrine cells, like your thymus, your heart, your liver, your stomach, your kidneys, and your small intestine. Classes of hormones. We have peptides that can act as hormones, amines glycoproteins, and steroids. The lipid-soluble hormones, your steroid hormones, can pass through cell membranes, the hydrophobic um, 
layers, remember, on the outside, while the water-soluble ones, the polypeptides and the amines, are not able to. So the receptor is going to be in positions where they are able to recognize those hormones. So the solubility of the hormone will correlate with their location, whether the receptor is inside the cell or on the cell surface. Okay, so water-soluble, insulin, epinephrine, those are a couple of examples. The hydrophilic, so their receptors would be more likely to be found on the surface. While cortisol and thyroxine being hydrophobic, their receptors would be more likely to be found inside the cell. Um, we talked a lot about cell signaling earlier on. Um, their paths to reach um, their target will depend on what type of solubility they have. Water-soluble hormones will be secreted via exocytosis. They're able to travel through the bloodstream, which is made up um, largely of water and bind to those cell surface receptors. While the lipid-soluble ones diffuse across your membranes, um, they are going to travel via transport proteins, and then they diffuse into the membranes of the target cells to find um, their receptors inside the cells. Okay, so the lipid soluble hormones can't travel through the blood on their own. The water soluble hormones can, hormones can't. The receptors for the water soluble hormones are found on the target, um, are the membrane of the target cell. They can influence uh, your regulation or they can influence your cytoplasmic response. While the lipid soluble hormones, once they reach um, the cell membrane and move through it via the transport protein, they're going to find the receptor and they will influence regulation and then your cytoplasmic response. Signal transduction pathways will cause um, changes for the water soluble hormones in the cytoplasm, activating enzymes or changing your expression of your gene, affecting your um, factors that influence their um, transcription or translation. Um, epinephrine. Um, is going to have multiple effects in terms of mediating your short-term stress. It binds to plasma membrane receptors of liver cells, which cause molecules to be released that activate enzymes and send out glucose into your bloodstream so you can make lots of energy to deal with those short-term stresses. So there's a G-protein coupled receptor, adenylocyclase, CAMP serving as a second messenger, um, activating protein kinase A, which prevents glycogen from being synthesized and promotes glycogen breaking down into glucose. Lipid soluble hormones typically are just going to impact gene expression. Um, examples will include your steroids, your thyroid hormones, and the vitamin D hormonal form. They'll bind to protein receptors either in the cytoplasm or the nucleus. Um, they then can act as transcription factors or the, along with pr the receptor protein complex complexes can act as transcription factors in the nucleus um, regulating gene transcription. So there's estradiol, um, which is a receptor. Um, estradiol is the same as estrogen. There's its receptor. It enters through the cell membrane um, with its protein helper. That complex can then enter into the nucleus and impact the transcription for vitelligenin. Hormones can act in multiple ways. There could be multiple receptors for the same hormone, or there could be multiple signal transduction pathways that hormone can act on. Um, so in the first example where you have the same receptor, but you have different intracellular proteins that are being impacted, um, you see that you have different responses. So we've got liver cells and we've got skeletal muscle blood cells. Epinephrine is able to act on the beta receptor for both. In the liver cell, it's going to cause glucose to be formed by breaking down glycogen. And in the skeletal muscle cell, it's going to cause the um, blood vessel to dilate, to expand, to account for that increased blood volume. Um, there is also an alpha receptor on um, blood vessels. Um, we find that with the intestinal blood vessel. And we see that when epinephrine acts on that intestinal blood vessel, it's going to cause it to constrict. So it's going to minimize um, digestion taking place at that particular time. Because again, you're dealing with a short-term stress. Digestion is not high on the priority list. Local regulators, we talked about before, they're secreted molecules that are only going to impact your neighboring cells. They allow them to kind of work together 
or regulate the cell that's being secreting. It's going through the secretion process. Examples of local regulators are your cytokines, your growth factors, just proteins, nitric oxide, and prostaglandins. Um, in the immune system, prostaglandins um, are able to promote fever, inflammation, um, and they cause your pain um, sensitivities to increase help to um, aggregate platelets, which will lead to blood clots forming. Coordinating neuroendocrine and endocrine signaling. Um, one example of this is with butterfly larvae. Um, the molting signals originate in the brain and both molting and development in insects are controlled by um, multiple hormones. There's a brain hormone, PTTH, which will stimulate the release of the ectosteroids from the prothoracic glandins. And then there's juvenile hormone, which is able to promote larval characteristics being retained. Ectosone um, is able to promote molding, molting when there is juvenile hormone present and development when juvenile hormone is absent um, so that you can move from being a juvenile to an adult. Okay, so there's just kind of an example of that. Um, lots of feedback regulation when it comes to your hormones, antagonistic hormone pairs um, that work in concert with one another. Again, the whole idea is to maintain homeostasis. They're assembled into regulatory pathways. Once they are released from an endocrine, endocrine cell, they travel through the bloodstream um, either alone or with a receptor or, or with a helper protein. And then they interact with receptors to cause that physiological response. We talked about this a little bit when we did digestion. Um, the acidic contents of the stomach, when they move into the duodenum and the small intestine, will cause your endocrine cells to secrete secretin, um, or secretin, um, which then causes your pancreas um, to increase the pH, okay, so that we can um, neutralize that acidic, um, the acidic contents that have been placed into the duodenum. Um, so, Neuroendocrine pathway, the stimulus gets recognized by a sensory neuron, sensory neuron, I can't talk today, which then stimulates a neurosecretory cell. That will then secre um, secrete a neurohormone, which then goes to the blood cells and bloodstream and travels to its target. So this is talking about um, oxytocin being used to release milk in um, mammary glands. So our stimulus is um, a baby suckling. Um, that stimulus sets off a sensory neuron, which releases the neurosecretory cell, which releases the neurohormone into the blood, ve um, blood vessels. The neurohormone is the oxytocin in the posterior pituitary. Um, that oxytocin reaches its target cells, the smooth muscles in your breast, and then that causes milk to be released. So this would be an example of a positive feedback. Negative feedback inhibits the response. A positive feedback reinforces that response. Hypothalamus and pituitary are essential to endocrine regulation. Um, these pathways are regulated by your nervous system. That includes your brain. Your hypothalamus gets information from your nervous system and then initiates the responses in your endocrine system. Uh, pituitary gland is attached to your hypothalamus. Um, the posterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary make that up. Um, posterior pituitary is able to both store and secrete hormones that are made in the hypothalamus, while the anterior pituitary makes and releases hormones that are under hypothalamus regulation. So the anterior pituitary is able to make hormones that are regulated by the hypothalamus and then release them, while the posterior pituitary does not make the hormones, but it stores and secretes them that are made by the hypothalamus directly. Okay, so there's your anterior, there's your posterior. You can kind of see um, where the hypothalamus is. Um, we'll come back to the pineal gland um, and the pituitary gland, which is what we're going to be focusing on right now in the brain. Posterior pituitary hormones, there are two hormones that are made by the hypothalamus that are stored in the posterior pituitary and then released that act on non-endocrine tissues. That would be oxytocin, 
We just talked about that one with the milk secretion by the mammary glands. It also plays a role in uterine muscle contractions um, during labor. And then the ADH, which we just got done talking about with the excretory system, um, which is able to help to regulate blood osmolarity. Um, when the blood osmolarity increases, ADH is released um, to allow the kidneys to take back in, the collecting ducts to absorb, or sorry, to take back water that they were getting ready to release to, um, and also causes thirst so that you can increase your overall blood volume and get that osmolarity back down to where it should be. All right, so those are the two, the ADH and the oxytocin. Those are the hormones. And once they are released from the posterior pituitary, those are their targeted cells. The anterior pituitary, um, again, is able to release and inhibit hormones based on hypothalamus signals. Um, prolactin releasing hormone from the hypothalamus um, will cause the anterior pituitary to make, um, sorry, to secrete prolactin which will um, play a role in your milk production. There's lots of different processes that are regulated by these hormones. Um, metabolism, osmoregulation, reproduction are some examples. So there are several um, of the anterior pituitary hormones, FSH, LH, TSH, ACTH, PRL, MSH, and GH. FSH and LH are involved in reproductive processes, TSH is going to influence your thyroid. Um, ACTH is going to impact cortisol levels. We talked about PRL already. MSH is the melanin that's found in your melanocytes. And then GH affects lots of different body tissues, including your bone. Tropic versus non-tropic. Tropic hormones are regulating the function of your endocrine cells and glands. You gotta have all these checks and balances in place. You need to have something that's controlling what's controlling everything else. Non-tropic hormones will regulate your target cells and your tissues and organs. So tropic hormones that are affecting endocrine tissues, we talked about how gonads are um, endocrine glands. So your FSH and LH are gonna play a role with that. We also said that the adrenal gland is gonna be um, one of your endocrine glands, so ACTH would fall in there as well. Um, growth hormone, GH, is secreted by your anterior pituitary gland. It can affect your endocrine glands, and it can impact on the um, tissues that are being affected by those hormones because it can promote growth directly. It has a lot of effects with metabolism, and it can make lots of correct or encourage the stimulation and production of lots of growth factors. Um, if you have too much GH, you can um, develop gi gigantism. Well, if you have too little GH, you can have dwarfism. So here is another example, or this is just breaking down the anterior pituitary, the anterior pituitary hormones. Um, what they all impact, the ones that have tropic effects, the ones that have only non-tropic effects, that would be your prolactin and your MSH melanocytes, and then the GH, which has both tropic and non-tropic effects. So thyroid fell into the tropic. Um, hormones can stimulate the release of other hormones. Um, and then in this particular case, the last indicates, um, activates a non-endocrine target cell. So if a hormone is able to secrete other hormones, which then those hormones are able to, end, um, to activate a target, um, as opposed to having uh, the signal pathways we talked about before, you can have a hormone cascade pathway. This is going to happen. Thyroid hormone is released as a result of the hypothalamus, anterior, anterior pituitary, and your thyroid gland, which is found on your trachea surface. Um, these pathways do typically have some negative feedback involved. So if you are cold out, um, that would be your stimulus. A sensory neuron is going to um, interact with your hypothalamus, causing it to release thyrotropin-releasing hormone, TRH, through its neurosecretory cell. That hormone goes into your blood vessel. Um, and when that hormone is able to reach your anterior pituitary, 
it's going to cause TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone or thiotropin, um, to be secreted. That's going to move through your bloodstream until it reaches the endocrine cells and your thyroid gland. And there it's going to cause the secretion of T3 and T4. Thyroid hormone is then going to impact on your target cells, um, the body tissues it needs to interact with, and cause cellular met metabolism to increase. Once you have certain levels of T3 and T4, those can go back and kind of um, and cause TSH to no longer be secreted. They can also go back um, when those amounts are recognized by the hypothalamus and shut down the secretion of TRH. Thyroid um, function um, is known to be associated with um, various disorders. Um, there's two hormones that play a role, T3 and T4. T3 has three iodines, T4 has four. If you have too little um, of this thyroid hormone present, you can have hypothyroidism, which will cause your um, an increase in weight. You will be lethargic and you will not do well with cold. We just talked about how those help to get your metabolism up to generate heat so that you'll be warmer. Hypothyroidism is when you're making too much of those, so you aren't shutting things down, your temperature is staying warm, you're sweating a lot, you're losing a lot of weight because you're um, burning through energy, you're a little more irritable, and your blood pressure is going to be up because the volume is going to be up because things are going to be moving around a lot. Um, malnutrition can play a role in maintaining your thyroid function. Graves' disease is um, a form of hypothyroidism that is caused by immune um, system problems. And if you do not have sufficient iodine in your diet, you can have an enlarged thyroid gland, which is called a goiter. Um, hormone function over evolution can eventually diverge between species. Um, Thyroid hormone um, is one example of that. It plays a role in metabolism across lots of lineages. But in frogs, it also um, has taken on the role of reabsorbing the tadpole tail as it goes through metamorphosis. Um, prolactin is also seen to have a range of activities. MSH um, is going to control pigment distribution in melanocytes. Um, but it does this by um, regulating the skin color of your fish and your amphibians and your reptiles. And then in mammals, it plays roles in coloration, but it also plays some roles with hunger and metabolism. So there's your tadpole and turning into an adult frog. Endocrine glands can re um, respond to lots of different stimuli to regulate your homeostasis, your development, and your behavior. Um, the Glands that are, we've talked about a little bit before, that are endocrine. Um, parathyroid, which is found in your thyroid, your thyroid itself, pancreas, the adrenal glands, the gonads, and the pineal gland. And then hormones that are made in these glands include PTH, calcitonin, insulin, glucagon, catecholamines, corticosteroids, sex hormones, and melatonin. So first one we're going to look at is how calcium is controlled um, in mammal blood. Um, PTH and calcitonin are antagonistic hormones that work in concert with one another. Uh, parathyroid hormone is made by the parathyroid glands. Calcitonin is released by the thyroid gland. Um, if you increase your PTH, you're going to increase your calcium blood levels by taking calcium from your bone and absorbing calcium in your kidneys. Um, and another, um, effect it can have is to activate vitamin D in your kidneys, which will also um, encourage intestinal uptake of calcium from your diet. Um, calcitonin will work in the opposite manner. Again, they're antagonistic. It will stimulate the deposition or the depositing of calcium in your bones and that the calcium is secreted from your kidneys. Okay, so there's kind of that feedback mechanism. This one is just showing you the parathyroid. Um, I looked in your text. It didn't have anything for the calcitonin. Sorry. Insulin and glucagon. This is probably the one you're most familiar with. Insulin causes your blood glucose levels, blood glucose levels to decrease, while glucagon causes your blood glucose levels to increase. 
Um, the pancreas has endocrine cells present on it that are known as pancreas islets or islets of Langerhans that have alpha cells that make glucagon and beta cells that make insulin. Um, so insulin um, is able to reduce your blood glucose levels by um, breaking down glucose, or sorry, by causing cells to take up glucose, preventing glycogen from being broken down in the liver and turning it into fat. Um, glucagon makes blood glucose levels go back up by converting glycogen, breaking it down into glucose in the liver, and also breaking down fat and protein into glucose. So if you have not had um, ingested glucose over a period of time, glucagon is going to go to work. If you have ingested a more um, carbohydrate-laden meal, um, then your insulin would be going to work. Okay, and so that's just showing you that particular feedback mechanism. Um, diabetes mellitus is probably the best known endocrine disorder because insulin is either deficient or the tar um, response to insulin in the target tissues is not as effective. Type 1 is when you have a deficiency of insulin, autoimmune disorder, the immune system starts to attack your um, pancreatic beta cells and destroy them. Type two is when you are deficient in insulin or the target cells aren't responding to insulin the way they um, need to because there's been a change in their receptors. Stress control would be your adrenal hormones. Um, again, they're located near your kidneys. There's two parts to them, the medulla and the cortex. Um, they secrete hormones that are able to respond to stress, and the cortex also has some steroid hormones that can function as sex hormones. Um, the adrenal medulla is um, able to secrete epinephrine and norepinephrine, um, again, members of the catecholamines. Um, these hormones are going to deal with um, more short-term stresses, fight or, fight, fight or flight responses, um, they are going to help you get energy by triggering glucose and fatty acids so that you're able to go through respiration. Um, again, oxygen help with that respiration process. Um, focus on what's immediate, take blood towards the heart, the brain, the skeletal muscles away from your skin, your digestive system and kidneys, things that are important, but not essential to survive at that particular instant. They get your heart rate and blood pressure up. And these occur in response to involuntary nervous signals. If you have long-term stress, corticosteroids are released. Um, these are found in the adrenal cortex. They are triggered by the hormone cascade pathway via the hypothalamus and your ACTH. Two types that you can make are glutocorticoids and mineral corticoids. Um, an example of a glutocorticoid is cortisol, which will have a role with your glucose metabolism as well as your immune system. Um, and then mineral corticoids such as aldosterone, um, we talked about that one a little bit with the excretory system, which can impact your salt and your water balance. And then with reproduction, we have the gonadal sex hormones. Your gonads, your testes, and ovaries are going to make most of your sex hormones. Remember we talked about how the adrenal um, gland can make some as well, the androgens, the estrogens, and the progestins. Um, all three of these are found in both males and females, but in different proportions, significantly speaking. The testes are going to synthesize androgens, mainly testosterone, which will help to maintain and develop the male reproductive system, increase muscle, bone mass. Um, people will often take it to encourage muscles to grow, but there are a lot of health risks associated with that. Estrogens, specifically estradiol, are um, going to be, play a key role in maintaining the female reproductive system and developing those female secondary sex, secondary sex characteristics. Uh, progestins include progesterone, which is um, definitely a key factor in preparing and maintaining the uterus um, for um, carrying an embryo. And synthesis of those hormones are controlled by both FSH and LH, which are found in the anterior pituitary. Um, issues with endocrine, um, dis endocrine, endocrine disruptors. So there was a time when women that were um, having complications with the pregnancy were prescribed synthetic estrogen, DES. 
um, women who were treated with DES who had daughters um, were more likely to have issues with their reproductive systems. Um, they um, cancers, and then there were physical um, changes and um, miscarriages were increased. It is an endocrine disruptor um, because it was disrupting the function of that hormone pathway specifically for es estrogen. Biorhythms, melatonin, the pineal gland, that little tiny one in your brain secretes melatonin and it is controlled by light and dark cycles. Um, and it is thought that its functions appear to be related to rhythms associated with reproduction. And then this is just kind of a summary of all of those hormones that we talked about. 